least favorite things in the world to do. Um, but unfortunately, that's the task I've been handed today. Uh, it's so good to be here with you again. I was here back in the summer uh, and got to preach from Philippians then. If you were here, I've, got, I've been able to preach that particular message a few different places, and every single time, I'm just always remembered as the guy who just put up pictures of his kettle up on the screen. So if you remember, if you were here, you'll remember that. Maybe now it's all coming back to you. Uh, but it's really good to be here. I really enjoyed my time here. Uh, it's just encouraging. You guys are really hospitable, and I, and I love that. Um, is that me? Am I making that sound? Yeah, it is accidental, I promise. Uh, but no, it's, it's, it's a blessing to be here. It's been a blessing to get to know Alex this past year as well. Just a gift to me in that relationship. Uh, as he expressed and communicated up here a few minutes ago, uh, his heart for this church and for the church in Vancouver, his posture toward this, the church in our city is a real gift. Um, and so as a pastor in Vancouver, I feel really blessed by that posture and yours for having me today. So thank you uh, for letting me be here. Uh, I just want to begin our time by reading our text for today. And it's found at the end of Philippians chapter 1 and into the beginning of chapter 2. So I'm going to start reading. If you have your Bibles open there, or if you use an app on your phone, you can open up to that. Philippians chapter 1, I'm going to start in verse 27. Paul writes this, Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him, since you're going through the same struggle you saw I had, and now here I still have. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. And we're going to stop there. So to set the trajectory for our time together this morning, we're going to spend almost all of our time together on those first four verses in Philippians chapter 2. They're going to form kind of the meat of our fine meal together today. However, before we get there, I need to acknowledge that Paul actually, at the end of chapter 1, the biggest reason why you read that last part of chapter 1, he actually, in that portion at the end of chapter 1, flashes what might just be his thesis statement for the entire book of Philippians. At the end of chapter 1 there, we see what might be his thesis statement for the whole book. And he says in verse 27, Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. What a word. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Now, I think you could argue that this is really the heartbeat of all New Testament letters. Conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of Christ's gospel. But certainly for this letter to the Philippians, this is the exhortation to rule all exhortations. Daryl Johnson, a pastor in Vancouver, describes this exhortation as the driving force of this whole letter. This is what carries the letter forward everywhere else. When you read Philippians, this is the driving force of the whole letter. And the exhortation in verse 27 starts with the words, if you noticed, in the translation we read, whatever happens, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of Christ's gospel. But this word that's translated as whatever happens in the Greek is this word monos, which is actually better translated as only or merely, only. And, and to return to Daryl, Daryl actually works off this translation when he writes about it, and he says this about this verse. He says, quote, by putting only at the beginning of the sentence, Paul is saying, in effect, let me get to the major reason why I'm writing. Only. If the Philippians will do this one thing, this only, 
they will move forward in the will of Jesus for his church. Only live your lives in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. If that's all we take from this morning, may that go with us out of this place. Write that down on a note card and tape it everywhere you go throughout your day. Put it on your bathroom mirror for a morning reminder. Put it on your car dashboard for the drive to work. Actually, that might be a really bad idea. Maybe disregard that one. But this verse is a driving force for everything that we do in our lives as followers of Jesus. This is our rubric for life in Christ. Live as citizens of the gospel of the kingdom of God, striving together as one in the name of Jesus. Conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of this good news. So then the whole rest of the letter to the Philippian church is really just a breaking out piece by piece of what doing that actually looks like. What does it actually look like to conduct ourselves in this manner worthy of Christ's gospel? And it's with that context in mind that we arrive at what comes immediately after at the beginning of chapter 2. Immediately following this exhortation, beginning of chapter 2, we arrive at where we're going to land for today. Now, to help you get to know me a little bit better, a little bit more about myself, I'm currently finishing up, I'm almost done, I'm graduating this semester with my master's at Regent College. And as a grad school student, I love to write. I really love to write. I love writing papers. And I know that that seems weird to a lot of people, and I grant that, but I love to write papers. I am, however, one of those people, one of those paper writers who like way overuses commas. And then I can end up looking back at a paragraph I've just written and realize that I'm eight lines in and I'm still working on my first sentence. Can anybody else relate to this? Is anybody else like this? No, it's okay, it's just me. Wow. Well, I thought I'd have some solidarity. Well, I have, I have good news for myself, maybe bad news for all the rest of you today. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11 to imitate him as he imitates Christ. So really, I'm just following Jesus, maybe a little more accurately than the rest of you. <laughs> Obviously, this is a joke. It's a joke, I promise. But if you've noticed, Paul, as you've read Paul in the past, Paul's kind of the, the all-time king of run-on sentences. This is the way that Paul writes. He writes with crazy run-on sentences. And I tell you this just to say that at the beginning of chapter 2, these, for, these four verses we see is actually, if you can believe it, one big run-on sentence. These first four verses of chapter 2 is all one big run-on sentence. It's said to be the longest run-on sentence in the New Testament, coming in at 82 words in the original Koine Greek. 82 words. Even I'm impressed by that. And this would be difficult enough to track with for translators if it weren't for a few other factors that come to play in the, in the process. This letter would have been written by Paul on papyrus, which is basically an ancient form of paper made from reeds being pressed together. Like, basically, it was expensive to make. And Paul's an itinerant preacher. He's traveling around preaching. He doesn't have a lot of disposable income. So the common practice with papyrus in this day was to conserve papyrus, conserve money, was to cram as many words as possible onto one page. But it also didn't stop there. They would also try all kinds of other tactics to conserve space. One of these that they would use was to get rid of any and all punctuation to try to save space. So in the original text, there are no commas, no periods, no dashes, no semicolons. In fact, there are no spaces in the original text. Maybe this is giving you a sense this morning of how technical a task Bible translation is and why we have so many English versions today. But I promise I'm getting somewhere with this. It's not just Intro to Bible 101. But in the process of doing the difficult work of trying to untangle this web of letters that form this run-on sentence from Paul and make some kind of coherent translation that makes sense, I would say that 99% of modern translations mask the fact that in the original language, in that entire paragraph, that run-on sentence at the beginning of chapter 2, these four verses, there is one verb. There's one action word, one verb in this whole first four verses of chapter 2. 
Now, in our translation, the NIV that I just read from, there are a bunch of verbs. But in the original text, there's just one. And we find the verb right in the middle of the passage. In verse 2, where Paul says, Make my joy complete by being like-minded. Should I use this? Okay. No problem at all. Make my joy complete by being like-minded. So make my joy complete is the one verb found in the entirety of this long, complex run-on sentence. Seems like it's something pretty important. Now, as you already know from, from any other readings of Philippians you may have had in the past, joy is a fundamentally important idea in the book of Philippians. You see joy, the idea of joy, sprinkled all throughout this letter, specifically joy amidst adversity. We know this because the Greek word for joy here, kara, Paul uses it 16 times in this short letter. It's all over. It's kind of this undercurrent that runs all throughout Philippians. But the verb here that the NIV translates as make my joy complete, the one verb for our passage today, is this Greek word pleru. And if it's a helpful picture for you, it can also be translated as fill up my joy to overflowing. Fill up my joy to overflowing, which is a picture I just love. Fill up my joy to overflowing. But this command to make my joy complete or to fill up my joy to overflowing is kind of the fulcrum point of this whole paragraph. It's the hinge moment of the whole paragraph from Paul. And everything that comes before this command, this verb, is kind of the why, the why for the verb. And then everything that comes after the command is the how, the how for the verb. So everything before is the why, everything after is the how. And so everything before being the why, for those of you who were those kids that always asked like, mommy, why, or daddy, why, we all know those kids, this section will feed your soul today. I'm frankly terrified that my daughter is turning into one of those kids, but I probably had it coming, so I can't complain. But then after the verb, in the middle of this section, everything that comes after is the how, the practical implementation. Here's how you complete my joy by being like-minded. Here's the nuts and bolts for your everyday life. And so in studying this and coming at it today, I'm going to do something a little bit unorthodox this morning, and I'm going to have us look at the second piece first, the how, before we finish our time together with the why. Flipping it on its head a little bit, but we're going to start by looking at the how and then finish with the why. So Paul says, make my joy complete, brothers and sisters. Fill up my joy to overflowing by being like-minded. And what's the how? Paul starts out by saying, by having the same love. Having the same love love. I mean, love's always the first one on the list, right? If you're new to church, answering Jesus or love to any rhetorical question from the platform usually sets you up for good results. But certainly when Jesus himself says in John 15, my one command is love each other, Jesus boils it all down to love, having the same love, and Paul carries that on here. How do we complete Paul's joy? By having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. This, verb, this literally means translated thinking the exact same thing, being one in thinking and in feeling. It's almost hard to believe, but Paul envisions a church that is like-minded, one in thinking and in feeling, on the same page, focused on the one thing. Sometimes it's hard to even fathom thinking it's possible to have a group of people be like-minded, be one in thinking and in feeling. But Paul has this vision for a church that would be like-minded, one in thinking and in feeling, on the same page, on task for the one thing, the most important thing. And then Paul gets direct. He says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. So selfish ambition, kind of loosely translated as doing whatever it takes to get ahead. Selfish ambition. You know, you know those people who always have to be the center of attention? 
you know, who always have to be on the stage with a microphone under the lights, being the one talking and everyone else is listening. You know, those people. I pray for those people. Jokes, obviously, but there's something in us as humans that makes us want to get ahead, right? Selfish ambition. Maybe it's helpful to think just for a second about how you feel before you filtered it through, you know, all your helpful filters, how you feel as a knee-jerk reaction when someone around you, whether it's a boss or a neighbor or someone in your workplace or in your life, gets a promotion or a raise or whatever, your knee-jerk reaction, does it ever make you like kind of a little bit like mad or upset? Like a tinge of envy, like a tinge of jealousy. Maybe it's just me, and that's fine. I'll admit it. But there's something in us as humans, I think we can all relate, that we want to get ahead. Even if it means we have to step on a few people or cut a few corners along the way. We want, ahead. It, it, we want to get ahead. It's for the ultimate purpose. Selfish ambition. Paul says, do nothing out of selfish ambition. Submit that to Christ. Or he goes on, don't do anything out of vain conceit. Now, the word vain literally means empty. He's basically saying you have nothing to brag about. It's futile. It's pointless. It's empty. You have nothing to brag about. And I think we know that, but because of that, we're almost even more insecure about it. So we do it even more. You know, when you see someone that you haven't seen in a while, this is an interesting way that we express this. When you see someone you haven't seen in a while, and you ask them, oh, how are you doing? How's life? What's the most common response that you might hear other than the, the kind of classic good? It's, oh, good, but busy, right? Oh, it's been, oh, it's been busy. It's been a really busy season. Oh, we've been really busy. I feel like COVID was a hilarious case study on this because COVID hit and the world shut down and things stopped for everyone. And all of a sudden, nobody was busy. And we had to come up with other things to say to each other when we saw each other on the street or ran into people we hadn't seen in a while. Some people would still say busy, and you'd kind of stand there and go, really? But busy, we say this, we default to this, I think out of this sense of like self-importance. Because busy in our modern translation means in our minds important, got a lot going on, really needed for things. We like to make it seem like we're more important than we are or at least than others are. And Paul says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain, empty conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself. And this flips our cultural script on its head. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Now, I do want to say, I think we need to understand what Paul is not saying here. Paul is not saying... Think of others as better than you. Ah, you know, that person, so-and-so, is just better than me. Ah, I, I stink. Alex is it's just better than me. He's not, by the way. Just, Alex, Alex, you're not better than me. No, Paul's not saying to live with this sad resignation that everyone else is just better than you. He's saying to put others' needs ahead of your own. Value others as more important than yourself. You know what? Alex is not better than me. And don't you forget that. But Alex's needs are more important than my own. I'm called to put Alex's and others' needs ahead of my own. And wow, I'm not very good at that. And our culture... In our, glory, or in our glorification of the self-actualization project and freedom of individual autonomy, this isn't even a value anymore. We don't even value this anymore or pursue it. We need, as the church, to relearn that value. Paul says, do everything out of humility, valuing and prioritizing others' needs ahead of your own. This is what Paul means. Put your spouse's needs ahead of your own. Put your children's needs ahead of your own. Kids, put your parents' needs ahead of your own. It's hard to believe. Families, put the gospel's needs ahead of your own. Put your friends and family members who don't know Jesus' needs ahead of your own. 
Put this city's needs ahead of your own. Value others above yourself. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. It's really an others-oriented, others-centered way of life. And it radically reorients the cultural narrative that we live and breathe in a city like ours. So that's Paul's laundry list of the how. How do we make Paul's joy complete? How do we bring his joy to overflowing? That's kind of the the quick laundry list of the how. And I know that there's a lot that we just flew through. But really, I think we can see that when it boils down, when we take all of that content and boil it down, it boils down to this idea of unity, right? Unity. This ever-elusive concept of unity. Living worthy of the gospel of Christ means living in unity, living together in harmony, moving in the same direction, united in spirit and in mind. But another thing that's really important to clarify is that Paul's call to unity does not mean uniformity. It does not mean making making carbon copy disciples. It does not mean institutional sameness. It does not mean that all of our city's churches need to look exactly the same. To return to Daryl Johnson, I love the way that he describes reasons for this. He says, for one thing, we humans are far too wonderfully diverse for uniformity. For another, no one way of being disciples of Jesus can possibly manifest his multifaceted glory. I love that. Think about that. I'll give an example. Like I've talked about a little bit, I have a daughter, she's two, and I think, and again, I may be biased, but I like to think not, I think my daughter's the cutest little girl on the planet. And I think there's a picture of her maybe on my other slides. Okay, this is my daughter. Her name's Wesley. I know, right? Right? So I think my daughter's the cutest little girl on the planet. I would want nothing to be different about my daughter. However... I hope that my next child is not a carbon copy of my daughter. My daughter, everyone, when they see her, and if you met my wife, you'd see it too. My daughter has my wife's eyes. They're these big, beautiful blue eyes, gorgeous, striking. And my daughter has her blue eyes, and everyone sees her and says, oh, you have your mom's gorgeous eyes. She has all these traits and characteristics of us. But I hope that my next child maybe has some of the other characteristics and traits and char- of, of us. In short, I really want my next child to have my curly afro. I'd really love that. Love that. Now, I think my daughter's so incredibly cute and perfect, but I hope that all of our kids don't look the exact same. Because I hope that some other attributes of my wife and I are displayed through the next. And this is hopefully a helpful illustration that our diversity in the church and as followers of Jesus is not a problem. It represents the beautiful, multifaceted glory of God on display through the diversity in his church. It's actually important. So if unity does not mean uniformity, how do we know what it means? Well, we know what it means by reading Philippians 2, 1 to 4, in the context of the letter as a whole. In the context of this letter to the Philippians. So if you notice in in chapter 2, the first word is the word therefore. The first word is the word therefore, which always means maybe you've heard the expression when you see the word therefore, you have to find out what it's there for. Maybe you've heard that, maybe you haven't. But basically, when we see therefore, we need to look back and see what came right before it to understand what it's trying to talk about. And so if we look before it to find out the context for this unity that's being presented, what comes right before, what did I say at the beginning of this message was the driving force of the whole letter. This chunk of text that comes right before chapter 2. Verse 27. Only live in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Live as citizens of the gospel, striving together as one in the name of Jesus, making the first things the first things. See, unity is not the main thing. Unity is a means to an end. The aim 
is the gospel of Jesus, the good news of Jesus, living worthy of the gospel of Christ. The aim is as a church to live out the gospel, to live out the good news of Jesus. And Paul is ever so aware that in order to do that, you need to stay unified. In order to compellingly live out the gospel, to live in a way that is worthy of the good news of Jesus, unity is a necessity. That's the point. The point is the good news of Jesus. The point is the love of Jesus and to live as people of the gospel of Jesus. And unity is a necessary means to living that out. And this is a challenge. I think we have a real tendency to rally around preferences. I think the church in our moment has a real tendency to come together around all kinds of preferences. Around a personality, or a teacher, or a worship leader, or a building, or a style of music, or a particular demographic, or a political stance in our day, or whatever it might be. We have a real tendency to rally around preferences. But as we've seen far too many times over the years, especially in recent years, if preferences are the glue that's holding a church together, it's only a matter of time before that church falls to pieces. It is only a matter of time. What happens when the personality moves on? Or when there's a new show in town? Or a truth comes to light about something that was always going on? It's only a matter of time. But if and when a church comes together around the gospel of Jesus, around the good news of Jesus and his love for one another, for the city, not around a personality or a teacher or a worship leader or a building or whatever, but around the gospel of Jesus and faithfully living it together in unity. When the main thing is, listen, I'm here for the good news of Jesus. I'm in all the way. I jumped in the deep end and every inch of my life is saturated with the good news of the kingdom of God in the here and now. In every single one of the moments of my day, in every single one of the relationships in my life, I'm here for the mission. I'm here to live it out. I'm here all in for the gospel. When that's the glue and that's the mission of the church, that church will stand the test of time. It isn't about uniformity. In fact, it isn't even about unity. It's about the gospel of Christ. And our unity and harmony are a vital means to that end. Many have put it this way as a helpful illustration. The gospel has the power to pull us together into a symphony. But members of the symphony don't all play the same instruments nor do all the members play the same note. Most importantly, they don't even play their own compositions. What they do is they play the same musical score under the, direct, the direction of the same conductor. And the result is, is not unison, but harmony. And it's ultimately this conductor, the conductor of the symphony, the author of this musical score, who at the very core of his being depicts for us this beautiful, life-giving picture of self-giving unity. We find that picture in our conductor, in our God himself. It is this divine conductor, the author and perfecter of this gospel, of our faith, who presents us with the why of our unity. The why of the one verb and command in this paragraph. The why behind the command of complete my joy, fill my joy to overflowing by being like-minded. Why? Because the one who has called, him to himself, called us to himself is one. He is unity personified. And I say this because Paul does this super cool thing in our text that he does all over his writings in the New Testament, if you've ever noticed. And that's that he makes reference to the Trinity, this God in three persons, without ever actually using that specific language. Look at the beginning of Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 and the beginning of verse 2. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, 
if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded. Being united with Christ, Jesus, God the Son. If you have any comfort from his love, his is not actually in the Greek, but it's added to the English text, as most scholars agree it's referring to the love of the Father, God the Father. And then fellowship with the Spirit. Paul lists each of the members of the triune God as a backbone for this love and unity. The why of our unity, the why of our being like-minded, of having the same love, Paul's presenting it as it's because at the very core of who our God is, this triune God of grace is one. He is trinity within unity. He is unity personified. Our God in his very being is the beautiful divine paradox of being three in one. Three persons eternally existing in mutuality, in harmony, and love, and union. And that's why when John writes in 1 John chapter 4 that God is love, he doesn't just mean that God is loving, like it's an attribute of his character, but that he is love at the very foundational and formative core of who and how he is. In his being, God is love. The Hebrew Shema in Deuteronomy chapter 6 that all these hearers would have had memorized. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And God is love, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And friends, this is really important, so hear me on this. A disunited Jesus community does not reflect the essential character of its Lord. A disunited Jesus community, church, does not reflect the essential character of its Lord. See, Jesus in John chapter 17, he's praying to the Father in his famous high priestly prayer, and he prays for the church, the church that was going to follow him, and he prays that they may be one, even as you and I are one. He's saying that to God the Father. He's saying just like you and I are one, he's praying that the church that would come after him would be one, would be united, that they may be one. Michael Reeves, in his little book, Delighting in the Trinity, writes this, As the Father, Son, and Spirit have always known fellowship with each other, so we in the image of God are made for fellowship, for unity. And I want to repeat, a disunited Jesus community does not reflect the essential character of its Lord. So I want to ask, in light of this, in reflecting on this, in what ways have we church lost sight of the gospel for the sake of preferences in what ways have we or you lost sight of counting others more important for yourself than yourself for the sake of vain conceit in what ways have we lost sight of valuing the needs of others over our own for the sake of selfish ambition and how today, friends, today, church, might we need to repent of these things and make them right? Put first things first. Paul writes, only, merely, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. And to finish, I just want to leave us with one more quote from Daryl Johnson, just because he's a lot more brilliant than I am. He says this, what Paul is calling us to, what Jesus is praying us into, is harmony. Living in harmony with each other's unique experience of and expressions of Jesus. Working together in different ways toward the same goal. That goal being the glory of God and the transformation of the world. May that be our mission. May that be our first thing. And may we pursue unity and harmony with one another and with the church around us for the sake of the glory of God and the transformation of the world. Let me pray for us this morning. Lord God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, 
Thank you that we worship a God we can look to and see embodied, personified, the perfect representation of three in one, of, of trinity and unity, of unity and love at the very core of who you are. That out of an overflow of your love, you created us, you created this world, and you invite us into this good news, this gospel mission on a mission to love those around us and love you with that same love. To love our city, to love our brothers and sisters in Christ, in this church, to love those we come into contact with who don't know you, Lord, in this same way. This is first things first for your glory and the transformation of our world. God, may we put these first things first. Lord, I pray for each of us that you would call to mind and bring before us by your Holy Spirit the areas and ways in our lives that we put other things first. The areas in which we pursue avenues based on selfish ambition or vain conceit, trying to get ahead, pushing somebody down for our own selfish gain. Lord, may you call to mind where we're doing these things or where we're pursuing things based on preference, where we're getting frustrated with brothers and sisters in Christ over matters of preference, over secondary issues. And Lord, you call us to be unified, to live in harmony with one another for the sake of the gospel. Lord, may you bring us to a place of identifying where those areas in our, life, in our lives are and how to hand them over and submit them to you, Jesus. And God, I just pray that Cascades would have a picture and a vision and a mission to be a church in unity and harmony and on mission with the church in this city. That there be a heart of unity, not uniformity, Lord, but unity that reflects your character, that reflects your very being. And God, may you do all of this for your glory. Make your name great, Jesus, in this city and in this church. We pray all this in your name. Amen. One of the, one of the incredible and foundational